Good morning. So it's a pleasure to be down uh, at the Nutrition Conference. I've always heard great things about the conference, but this is my first uh, chance to, to get down here. I was teasing Lance. I, I wish he had been able to organize it last week during the Pearl Polar Vortex, but probably with my luck, I would have gotten stuck in Chicago, which was a lot worse than Pennsylvania last week. So. Uh, so to talk to today, I um, was asked to kind of give, give some insights into using experimental models to answer questions that have real world application and impact in, in the field. And to do this, I'm probably going to get myself in a little bit of trouble with some of the experimental researchers in the room, because I'm going to talk about some of, some of the challenges and limitations in what we do and in sort of what we've traditionally done. And I think this might explain some of the frustrations that the field nutritionists have when they go out and take all these nice, fancy JDS papers and try to apply those, those to the field. But I think there's really some complexity there that if we uh, step back and appreciate, we can really sort of get a better understanding of what's going on. So my outline today going to start out talking about some of the limitations and frustrations of these traditional experiments. And this is really what limits our understanding of the biology of the cow and how best to utilize all these tools uh, that are at our disposal. I'm going to talk about experimental models. And, and to me, there's really kind of two big types of experimental models that I've been able to use. Um, and, and some of those really give insight into basic biology. And I'm going to give some examples of these perturbation models that we've used to understand fatty acid biohydrogenation and fatty acid trafficking in the body. And then I'm going to use an example of, of a challenge model that we've used that has really allowed us to get a little bit of a better understanding of products and strategies that are, have an impact on diet-induced milk fat depression. So we'll talk about HMTBA. Uh, high lake soybeans, and then Telbon trace, trace minerals. So a little bit of what goes into this last part is that when you have interest in milk fat depression and you have interest in products that may increase risk or decrease risk for milk fat depression, you have to set up a situation where you have milk fat depression, right? Because if that product only works when there's a problem, if there's no problem in that experiment, you can't see anything, right? So we're basically going in and setting up situations where we're changing things that we know change the risk factor for milk fat depression, now we can start to tease out some of those interactions. OK, so this discussion of, of uh, the changing thinking on nutrition is really not, not new or, or unique to my presentation. Really nice paper, uh, review paper by Barry Bradford. Um, so over that, that kind of summarizes this more from an immune function and disease perspective. But what it really comes down to is the past two decades have broadened our understanding of the interaction of nutrition and physiology. I guess I'm a milk fat guy, so, so CLA is, is, is sort of uh, the, the, the perspective I see things through. But I think our, our uh, identification of CLA as a bioactive nutrient that has such major impacts and real world implications in the dairy cow was sort of, to me, a turning point in our understanding of nutrition. So I think old nutrition was really about stoichiometry. And I imagine that a lot of the nutritionists in the audience loved general chemistry as a freshman, right? They loved balancing those equations. This is what goes into the reaction. This is what comes out of the reaction. And traditionally, that's what nutritionists did. My perfectly balanced diet took and, and calculated the nutrients in the diet, the nutrient requirements, and I made those match perfectly. And that was a perfect balance, right? That's important, and we still need to be doing that. But now we, have, we really understand these bioactive nutrients and nutrient interactions. So now we have to not just meet those requirements, but we have to include the right balance of these nutrients to optimize physiology to get the result that we want. So in Barry's uh, diagram here, he's talking about nutrients as building blocks that, that before they were just substrate for those reactions. And now there's all sorts of uh, substrate for, for building things, right? But now we have all these interactions. We have nutrient gene interactions, uh, uh, different reactions with different physiological processes, a lot, of, a lot more complexity than just this building block uh, uh, thinking. So what do we have to make evidence-based nutrition decisions? And, 
in uh, I, you know, that evidence-based term is what we hear a lot about from the, the medical community. Um, and if we think about there's a lot of different types of evidence and a lot of different types of information coming from the world. Uh, so field nutritionists really work off of these field observations. And I don't want to discount those, but we, we need to be uh, realistic about what they are. So some of that is instincts. And those can be really good instincts, right? But, but we want to appreciate what that, that's based on. Perceptions, now we have to be careful because there's all sorts of influences and perceptions that can lead us in the wrong direction. There'd be varying quality of data. I think we have the opportunity to gather a lot better data now that we have a lot of precision technology and, and um, uh, better data analysis methods. But we have to do that in the right way, right? We can very easily have junk going in and junk coming out uh, uh, that can lead us astray there. Uh, in the box I have sort of around what I think we do as experimental nutritionists, we can do these first principle mechanism experiments. So that's sort of demonstrating how the system works and which pieces interact, and that this can do that, right? So we have to be careful there that just because something can do something doesn't mean that it does it all the time. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's going to do it every time, right? But we can demonstrate what the potential is. We can demonstrate uh, that it can actually happen. We move up from there to production trials. And then we do a bunch of production trials. And we sort of usually end up in these situations where something worked here and not there and worked here and not there. And we've just confused and frustrated everybody. So somebody says, we better do a meta-analysis. And we'll put all this data together and figure out what's real and what's not real. There's value there. But I, I, I want to talk today a little bit about maybe we need to go beyond that. Maybe we need to figure out why did it work in some places and not in other places. But that is you know, gathering all of those production data experiments together, creating that, that meta-analysis that is robust. But, but it, it, it should not be the end of the story, in, in my mind at least. And then on top, I, I have epidemiology and field correlations. And you know, I, I guess as a, 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 a nutritionist, the term epidemiology kind of kind of scares me a little bit. Um, you know, we have to be careful about those type of things, that they're really correlation-based. I, I think we could do a lot more up here on the nutrition side. I started thinking about the old BST DHIA field study, which I think is a really neat example of sort of epidemiology, but I don't know if I would really call it that. It's really more of a, a clinical experiment in my mind. But we don't do a lot of uh, those type of field validation in a very controlled and robust way, or at least uh, uh, I think we could do a lot more there. But these are sort of the, the, the information that we have to make decisions. Now, there's inf varying quality of information. Um, when we run experiments, there's all these subtle details to that, to that that we have to consider when we're making our decisions. But this is the information we have to make those evidence-based decisions. So an experimental model is an experiment specifically designed to understand the mechanism and or demonstrate the effectiveness in specific situations. This is my definition. I'm sure there would be other definitions out there, but this is my definition. Uh, so we're not talking about ration balancing. We're not talking about um, uh, models to balance diets or models to predict diets. Uh, we can use mathematical approaches say determining rates, but we don't necessarily have to. The, these do not, do not require model, uh, mathematical modeling approaches. So I wanted to first give you some examples of where we've used experimental models to understand the basic biology of the cow. So uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of interest in when a fatty acid comes into the body, where does it go to? Does it go to the mammary gland to make milk fat? Does it stay in, in the uterus to help reproductive function? Uh, does it go to body fat reserves, right? So uh, we, we took this approach to look at omega-3 fatty acid me metabolism. So that fatty acid comes in uh, from the gut in chylomicrons into plasma, and then those chylomicrons are available for all of our tissues. Those fatty acids go into the liver. They come back out of the liver, packaged as VLDLs. Uh, we're going to release of MIFA out of adipose tissue. And we have a lot of interest in how does that fatty acid end up in, in the mammary gland. 
So to study this, we set up what's really a perturbation model. So we had ruminantly cannulated cows put an albumasal infusion line in, and we made uh, uh, purified preparations of free fatty acids that we then infused over a one-hour period. And that was either 80 grams of ALA or 80 grams of EPA and DHA. So these are those very long chain omega-3 fatty acids that we predominantly find in fish oil or algae oil. So this, and then we, we milked cows every, uh, every six hours for uh, a week. And the idea was to be able to look at the appearance of those omega-3 fatty acids in milk. Um, I sometimes call this the, the poor man's tracer technique because omega-3 fatty acids are so low in milk that we can enrich them above baseline and we can measure their transfer without having carbon-13 label or making radioactive cows. They, they really discourage us from making radioactive cows because that ends up making radioactive grad students, right? Um, uh, too, too, too much paperwork there. So uh, Don Palmquist back in the, the, the 70s used this technique with 14 carbon labeled palmitic acid. And what he observed there is that, that you had uh, what looks like two different transfers. You have a rapid transfer that occurs during the first 24 hours. And Don's interpretation of that is that's the fatty acid being absorbed in the gut and transferred directly to the mammary gland through the chylomicrons. And then he had this long, slow pool that he interpreted as the fatty acid going in adipose tissue, liver, or whatever other tissue, and then be recy being recycled out over time back to the mammary gland. And when we milk cows over time, that's, that's very similar to what we see. So this is the 18-3, and then this is our very long chain omega-3s. And you see a lot of transfer, a lot of enrichment in milk fat during that first 24 hours. And then we get this slow uh, enrichment until we, we end up back at baseline about seven days. What's really interesting is that if you look at these peaks, we're giving the same amount of these, right? But our peak of ALA is much higher and in my next slide, I'm actually going to quantify that. But that DHA, EPA and DHA, is not making it into milk at as high of a rate. Where is it going to? Well, if we look at plasma DHA, we spike plasma DHA. It comes down a little bit. And they look, at seven days, we've, we're still on this plateau of plasma DHA. So what this tells me is that plasma DHA is on a very different path than ALA. ALA is never never really uh, it, uh, coming up that, that uh, well, actually, this is DHA in our, our ALA treatment. Uh, ALA is coming up in plasma and it's dropping back, back down to baseline very quickly. But the cow is metabolizing EPA and DHA in a very different way. She's, she has very little EPA and DHA that she ever sees from any place. And when she gets these very long chain omega-3 fatty acids, she's holding on to them. She's incorporating them into phospholipid pools that have a very slow turnover rate and are not available to the mammary gland. So these very long chain omega-3 fatty acids are on a very different pathway and I think give us some insight into metabolic differences between these fatty acids. So then we went on to quantify these. So if we look at total transfer, how much of the bolus was transferred? 43% of the ALA was transferred to milk versus 22% of the EPA and DHA. So we all, almost have a one-fold difference in total transfer into milk fat. When we fit our double exponential pools and we look at our direct versus indirect transfer, this is as a percent of what's transferred. 85% of the ALA that is transferred is coming in the direct pool. 15% is coming in the indirect pool. We look at very long chain omega-3 fatty acids and we have 40% coming in the direct pool and almost 60% coming in the indirect pool. So really neat that those uh, uh, very long chain omega-3 fatty acids are so quickly being moved into these pools that are not available to the mammary gland, decreases their transfer to the mammary gland by 50%, but also switches it from being this direct transfer pool to this long-term indirect transfer pool. We've come back and we've looked at this across lactation and we see lower transfer in early lactation compared to peak in, in late lactation. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that I, I can draw a field feeding recommendation from this, but I think it really identifies that the cow um, is really distinguishing between these omega-3 fatty acids 
um, in metabolizing them in a different, different way. And I think she's holding on to those very long chain omega-3 fatty acids for very essential functions like immune function. Okay, so we also took a similar approach to look at uh, biohydrogenation of unsaturated fatty acids in the rumen. So for this, we uh, bolus into the rumen 200 grams of an oilseed oil, and we pick oil seeds that are high in a specific unsaturated fatty acid. And, along, and when we do that, that unsaturated fatty acid enriches the pool in the rumen. It's then biohydrogenated by the rumen microbes. You get synthesis of the intermediates, and we can go to complete biohydrogenation. And our goal is to look at the rates of this pathway and also the intermediates that are being formed. At the same time, we add in a, a small amount of odd-chain odd saturated fatty acid. This is not biohydrogenated, and it's not being lost in the rumen in any way except for passage. So we use this as a passage marker, and as, if we assume it passes at the same rate as our unsaturated fatty acid, we then can calculate biohydrogenation rate uh, uh, separate from that, that passage rate. So we take samples over time, uh, and then we basically are looking for enrichment of the pool and loss of that fatty acid. So this is what the data looks like when we look at uh, enrichment of 18.3 in the rumen. Um, so we give that bolus of 18.3, and we enrich the pool. So here we're going from 2% of rumen fatty acids uh, up to 11%, so we're getting a nice, you know, almost five-fold enrichment of that pool. And then over time, it drops off and comes back down to baseline. And as it's being lost, we see formation of the first intermediate, the second intermediate, and then the, the third intermediate, right? So we can, can recreate that biohydrogenation pathway, and we can actually see who's being made from who and in what, what order. What I think is interesting about this is look how fast this is happening. This is time zero. By two hours, we've basically entirely wiped out that 200 grams of oil that we added to the rumen. Very, very fast rate, right? Uh, so we've done these experiments with uh, uh, oil seeds enriched with different, omega, with different uh, unsaturated fatty acids. So here's our 18.3, that's low pool, so it's easier to enrich. Oleic acid and linoleic are a little bit more difficult to do because we have higher concentrations in the rumen. But we can still get our enrichments over twofold so, that, so we can uh, uh, get a pretty good quantification of, of the loss rate in, in the rumen. So when we look at our biohydrogenation rates, this is just the, the curve that we're fitting to these loss rates. We, we find biohydrogenation rates ranging from 40% per hour to 87% per hour. Um, so our, our 18.2 is 50%, oleic acid 44%, 18.3 is 87%. When we use our, our uh, 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 rates of biohydrogenation and, and rates of passage rate, and we calculate an extent of biohydrogenation, we're calculating out that you know, 85 to, to low 90s percent of that oil was biohydrogenated in the rumen. I'm really happy to see that because that's sort of what we expect from a plant oil or a, a fatty acid that's in a feedstuff, is that we expect 85 to 95 percent of it to be lost through biohydrogenation. So, so I think our rates are realistic because we're getting this extent that, that we would, would expect. So, what does this tell me about biohydrogenation? Well, I think quite often we think of biohydrogenation as being a limiting process or a slow process, right? 80% per hour is not slow. That's really fast. Uh, so I think at least this first step of biohydrogenation is really fast. So what's limiting biohydrogenation in the rumen? Well, remember here, we're putting in a, an oil. We're just taking 200 grams of oil and in, in mixing it with rumen contents. That's available immediately. What about those fatty acids that are in a, in a feed, right? They're not available immediately. We have to break down that feed particle. We have to release those fatty acids before the microbes have a chance to do their, their biohydrogenation, right? So I think what this tells me is that What's more important between our feeds is the rate of release of that fatty acid from the feed. 
And I think that explains the big differences we see, say, between distiller grains, where that oil is actually in the solubles part that's been dumped back on the grain, and it also has a bunch of phospholipids in it that's really quickly coming into solution uh, in the rumen, very rapidly available. Versus, say, fatty acids that are in cottonseed, which are within a seed coat, and they're not protected, they're not going to leave the rumen, they're going to be biohydrogenated, but they're being biohydrogenated, they're being released at a very slow rate, um, so then they don't have as much of an, an impact on, on the rumen. But this first step of biohydrogenation appears to be very rapid, and I don't think it's actually what's limiting, um, it's probably that release from, from the plant. Uh, now, the next steps are, are slower, right? Uh, I would still wouldn't call them slow, but they are slower, and that's why we're getting buildup of, of intermediates. So within this approach, we can also then model the intermediate pools, uh, and we can get, get, get some estimation of the rates of these intermediate pools and the use of, you know, the alternate pools that are in red versus the normal pathways that are, that are in blue. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the details of this slide because, honestly, I don't know a lot about compartmental modeling, and, and my students take the lead there, and, and uh, I, 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 I've been on faculty for 10 years. So I started out, I knew how to do everything in the lab. Now, there's some things we're doing that I, I don't know the details of doing, but I have some really good students that, that have, are, are working on that and have been making some neat observations of being able to quantify some of these um, intermediate pools. So, so I think that's going to be something we're going to gain some further insight from the data uh, based on this experimental model. Okay, so now let's change and talk a little bit about uh, the more applied side. So I always like this question of if, if every feed additive and management change proposed to give you two pounds of milk or more worked, why don't cows make 200 pounds of milk, right? Well, I think this comes down to that traditionally nutritionists and experimental nutritionists like myself have asked the binary question, yes, no question, does X work? That's a simple question, and we all like simple things, right? But the reality is uh, that what we need to be asking is how, if and how well X works depends on factors A through Z, right? So it's not a simple yes, no question. It's not, does this work? It's, when does it work? and when does it work better than other things, right? So we should be asking, when does it work, and how can I maximize the response? And oh, by the way, when we maximize the response, we maximize the return on that investment, right? And this is where I think the meta-analysis approach gets us a little bit astray, right? Because just it's asking simple question most of the time, does this work, yes or no? Now we can go into meta-regression and hopefully pull out some of these interactions if there's enough data there, but it's not, what I'd like to know is within that data set, what, what's, uh, what's about the situations where we got the biggest response so that we can use these, these things there and not use them when they're not going to provide a response. So what are our goals? Determine the response to the treatment, explain variation in response between cows, or predict response under a certain condition. So the frustration commonly occurs when statistically significant changes made in research studies are not directly observable on the farm. And that, that this is just what I hear from field nutritionists, right? Uh, but our experiments are designed to, to test the specific effect of one element in isolation rather than to predict the response, right? So when we go into experiments, we try to control everything as well as we can to be able to isolate the effect of that one thing. Now, everything we control is, is basically a set situation. So when we make that observation, it's that this product X works under the conditions that we tested, right? Now you're taking that out to the field, and there's all those other variables that we set are now moving around, right? So it becomes much more complex. Also, it's who are we trying to help? So this is distribution of milk fat. Um, in 1,700 cows in the data set we have. The 10th percentile is 2.1% milk fat, the 90th is 48 
So if you're trying to increase milk fat, how do you do this? Do you try to increase everyone to shift the whole distribution up? Do you help the ones at the bottom? So you take these at the tail and move them up, and now you move the mean up? You know, that, there might be more potential to do that, especially from the, the standpoint of bile hydrogenation induced milk fat depression. These cows probably have trans 10. If we solve that, we can help the average. These cows up here probably don't have trans 10 problems, right? We need a different mechanism to shift the whole distribution versus parts of this distribution. This is even a bigger issue with health, health and disease questions. I, I always say I like healthy cows. I don't like sick cows, so I, 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 I don't have examples there, and I, I'm not going to talk about health. Uh, but if we think about our transition cow problems, are we trying to help every cow? Well, some of those cows have it figured out. They don't have any problems in their transition, even in bad situations, right? There's still some cows that figure it out. There's other cows that, even in good situations, have a lot of problems, right? So it's really only part of that population that we really need to be thinking about. So, I, you know, social media is sort of an interesting place. This is actually a link from John Roche's uh, Facebook page one day that was this dynamic ecology blog, and it was titled The Insidious Evils of ANOVA. And they stated that in ecology literature is full of investigations of single factors that report significant p-values, but the r-squared and effect size are very small, less than 5%, which limits the impact of the observations in the real world. So they argue that they should require reporting of r-squared and effect size and shift to a response surface mentality. So specifically, more levels with fewer replicates fitting or surface through the data. So the thing is, can we ask how does y vary with x and how much of y is explained by x? So this r squared part basically is saying that even though something's significant, maybe in the real world it's only explaining a couple percent of the variation, right? So it might be significant, but maybe it's not all that big of a deal. So the example they give, and, and, and I think this is a good example, is on the crop side, how much nitrogen should you, or, or the question is, does nitrogen supplementation increase crop yield? And I think it's a good example going to the crop. So, so the chicken guys have it easy, right? But the, the crop guys have it really easy. So, so they can do these more complicated experiments. So if you just said, if I add nitrogen to a crop, do I increase yield? Well, this is the yes-no question, control in nitrogen supplementation. And yes, significant p-value, but look at all the variation there, right? But this, picking on nutritionists like myself, this is the question we ask. Does this work? Yes, no. Yes, it works, right? But is that the full story? No. Well, there's a response curve to this. So you could be asking, how much nitrogen should we be supplementing? So here they've done the dose titration, and you can find the optimal concentration. We do this sometimes in experiments. Nutritionists like me, experimentalists like me don't like doing it because it's a lot more work and it's a lot more treatments, right? Uh, but, but we should, should be thinking about our response, uh, responses. But then it gets even more complicated when we think about interacting factors because it's just not nitrogen dose. It's also, say, phosphorus, but it can even get more complicated with potassium or trace nutrients, right? Uh, but we're in the same situation. It's not a yes-no answer. We really need to be thinking about the interacting factors. So when you see something that works in, in a one experiment, you go to the field and say, well, it's not working here. This thing just doesn't work. Well, maybe it's not that it just doesn't work. It's not in the right situation. There may be other interactions that we have not identified. So are we missing important, important interactions? So this is just the start of a list of interactions. So we have all things on basal diets, you know, corn silage versus alfalfa, grass, sorghum, starch and fiber level and fermentability, fatty acid profile and availability, get into molds, yeast, mycotoxins, a lot of other dietary factors we could talk about. Cow physiological state, milk yield and level of intake, um, uh, negative energy balance, transition cows would be in there, disease challenges, gut integrity challenge, where's Lance? I added that for, for, for Lance. Uh, uh, so a, lo a lot of things that could go in on that disease side. Parity, you know what, 40% of our cows are, are first lactation, but 
We mostly exclude those from our experiments at, at, on our research farms, or at least we don't test those interactions very well. Genetic potential, I'm going to show some of this data. I think this is really interesting. There's a lot of really good data on the genomic side that we could be using uh, a lot more in nutrition, I think. Environment, heat stress, overcrowding, uh, but barn design, cow comfort, and many, many other interacting factors that can affect that response. So how much variation are treatments really explaining? I went and pulled data from two of my experiments. One's a fat supplement trial, and another is a CLA experiment. Pick the CLA experiment, because this is as big of a, a, a treatment effect as we can see in production parameters, right? So it's a lot of data, but here's milk yield, the difference between our treatments, the p-value of that difference, and the r-squared of our full model. So in this fat supplement uh, experiment, we had effect on milk fat, effect on dry matter intake, highly significant. Our models are explaining a lot of variation, right? But then if we look at the sums of squares, which actually SAS doesn't allow us to do, see in when we use uh, proc mix, we actually have to do type 3 solutions to do this. But we figure out where are those sums of squares? Only 4% of the sums of squares, 4% of that variation, was our treatment for fat percent. 8% for this 2 kilo difference in dry matter intake, right? So that's not a lot of the variation. Significant effect of treatment, important effect of treatment, but it's not explaining a lot of the variation, right? And this is what I'm saying is that there's a lot of other things explaining variation in these, and they may be interacting with our treatments. The CLA experiment, when we had this really big difference, so here we had um, you know, over a 1% change in milk fat, 400 uh, gram per day difference in milk fat. Uh, now we're up to treatment being 68%, 56% of our variation, right? So, so, but in a lot of these things where we're seeing small effects, it's not explaining a lot of the variation in, in that parameter. Now, I'm not saying it's not important. You know, two, 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 you know a, a 0.2 u ch unit change in milk fat is a lot of money. It is important, but it, we have to appreciate that there's a lot of potential for interaction there. Okay, so how much variation is there in milk fat? So this is data over uh, six years from Texas, Minnesota, Florida, and Pennsylvania. Uh, average milk fat in a herds was 3.75. This is herd data. You know, 30% of those are below a 3.6. 11% are below a 3.4. So we have a lot of variation in milk fat between herds, right? A lot of potential to have an impact. Uh, we've also recently published and have some more data on the seasonal rhythms. So we see the highest milk fat January 1, lowest July 1, but then we see a, a, a rhythm to milk yield with highest milk yield occurring in late March around the equinox, lowest milk yield uh, in September. So we, we have quite a bit of variation there, right? Um, just trying to point out that there, there's potential interactions there. So I wanted to go through a little bit of, of potential on genetics side. Um, so we don't have, or at least I'm not familiar with really good examples of nutrient by gene interactions in animals. But there's some really cool ones on the human side. Uh, uh, and here, it, this is looking at the risk of colon cancer based on dietary calcium intake. So the genotype on the left, it did not matter what the calcium intake was, had no effect on colon cancer risk. The genotype on the, the right, if you had low calcium intakes, colon cancer risk is increased by 1.5 fold uh, over having higher calcium intake, right? So this is where someday, hopefully, we'll get to the point of personalized medicine we'll, where they'll take your DNA sample and say, hey, this is the perfect diet for you. These are the perfect uh, uh, medicines that you, sh you should take. Um, we're not there from, ooh, uh, we're not there from a, uh, 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 medical perspective, but there are some really neat examples of this um, uh, that have been shown in, in the human population. So, uh, you know, what's the genetic difference in, in our dairy cows? Well, milk fat's an interesting part of this because milk fat is our most heritable production trait. You know, all of our production traits are, are, are pretty heritable, but milk fat would be the highest. But it's really unique in that, that there's only a handful of SNPs that explain the majority of the genetic variation. So my understanding is for milk yield, 
there would be you know, a thousand SNPs that each explain point something percent of the variation. With milk fat, we have about six or eight SNPs that explain 85 or 90 percent of the, the variation. Uh, DGAT1 genotype is the biggest of those. Um, and if we look at, uh, there's one genotype that's higher milk yield, uh, but it's lower milk fat percent and uh, lower milk fat yield. And this is why we sort of have kept differences in DGAT genotype, because if you're selecting for milk yield versus milk fat percent, there's some differences there. Uh, sorry, this figure has jumped around a little bit in our Mac to PC transition. So what's the interaction in DGAT1 genotype and diet? I, I don't know. We've started looking at this in some preliminary data. We can't see much of an inter interaction with risk for diet-induced milk fat depression in our limited data set, but we're doing a more complete analysis of that. But is there differences in utilization of preformed fatty acids, say supplementation with, with palmitic acid? Maybe. Uh, response to trans 10 cis 12 CLA, those bioactive fatty acids? Maybe. We, we don't know. So I wanted to know what's the genetic variation between herds. Uh, and this data is out there, right? We have PTA milk uh, uh, that's in our, our databases. So this is uh, PTA milk fat. So this is pounds per lactation. Um, in uh, this is 6,000 herds that uh, we could pull from DRMS uh, database. So if we look from the 10th to the 90th percentile, we only have about a 20 pound difference in PTA fat. So that's not a very big difference. When I sort of use this equation to uh, uh, figure out what does that mean for PTA milk fat percent, that's 10th to the 90th is 3.8 to 3.89. Basically, no genetic variation in milk fat between our herds, right? We did this because we were wondering if there's some herds that are low milk fat just because they've selected for cows that aren't high in milk fat, right? But it doesn't seem like uh, anybody's gone really that far uh, off the reservation in, in their breeding program. Now, there is a, quite a bit of diff variation in uh, genetic potential between cows. Uh, so this is 1,700 cows in one of our databases. You look at that milk fat percent. Again, big variation in milk fat percent, 2.7 to 4.8. The expected breeding value is negative 0.1 to 1.6. Now, this wouldn't be the entire genetic potential, right? Because the expected breeding value is the, the difference that's being transmitted. So the genetic potential of the cow herself would be, would be a, a larger factor than this. But at least we're, we're beyond uh, 0.25 units difference in genetic potential between, between those cows. So if we look at this, you know, we still have more variation in milk fat than genetic variation. There's still reasonable genetic variation. What's explaining that variation? Well, part of that is probably days in milk and, and milk yield and a couple other factors. But, but I, don't, I don't think we we're, we're yet able to explain as much of that variation as what I would like to. And um, I think there's probably uh, a lot of potential for interacting factors that, that there would be things that work better for some cows to make more fat milk fat than other cows. Uh, one of the things that, that we've seen um, is that there's a relationship between milk yield and milk fat percent. So this distribution from a 900 cow herd, that, that uh, data that, that I started um, data I had before 2015, but I started playing with this, making this slide in 2015. So uh, you, you split this, the whole herd at a 324. If cows less than 75 pounds were 38, 75 to 95 pounds were 32, greater than 95 pounds were 29. A pretty big difference. Now when we plot milk yield by milk fat percent, there's plenty of scatter here, right? Uh, genetic potential differences, a lot of other things going on. But the slope of that is pretty steep. You know, you have 60 pound cows at 4.0, and that line is down below, well below a three at that 120 pound cow. So, so uh, there seems to be a relationship between milk yield and milk fat percent. Well, why is this? Is this dilution? Maybe. Could, maybe just increase in lactose synthesis without increasing milk fat yield. Uh, I think that's biologically important because you're, 
differentially regulating lactose synthesis from milk fat synthesis. But this could also be that those higher producing cows are eating more feed, higher passage rates, maybe they have a higher risk for biohydrogenation. And we've actually seen this in a couple of experiments. I first saw this in an experiment uh, during my master's with Mike Allen. Um, and, and we've been able to replicate this a couple different times. So here we've had, we have groups of high producing cows and low producing cows. And this is a fat supplement trial. So cal uh, this is calcium solid as megalac and uh, palmitic acid as bergafat. And those high producing cows are making less milk fat than our low producing cows. Uh, and the, the calcium salt decreased milk fat in our high producing cows, but not in our low producing cows. And when we look at trans 10, that bioactive fatty acid, we see that it was increased um, in those high producing cows. So clearly higher risk for milk fat depression. So to change a little bit, uh, when we want to start teasing out some of these interacting factors with milk fat depression, we realized that we needed to understand our time course. Um, so most randomized block designs, or what we people commonly think as time course experiments, are confounded by period and cannot be used to interpret the effect of time on treatment. Uh, so you have to replicate feeding periods to separate interactions of forage changes, heat stress, days in milk, all those other things. So when somebody takes cows, splits them into groups, and feeds them for 90 days and tries to say, oh, it's taking 60 days to see my effect, it's, it's totally bogus interpretation of that data. You would have to do that experiment multiple times to be able to take out these, these period effects within that experiment. Uh, so I'm not sure there's a well-controlled experiment to say that rumen adaptation takes more than 10, 14 to 21 days. There's some nutrients with larger body stores that require longer feeding periods. Um, so we did an experiment to see how quickly we could get milk fat depression. We have our control diet. We caused milk fat depression with a low forage, high oil diet. Um, and you can see we, we progressively decreased milk fat over seven to 10 days. We get this increase in trans 10 isomers. Switch that cow back to a normal diet. We get recovery by day 18. So we did this to be able to say, we know milk fat depression occurs rapidly. So now we can design experiments where we have uh, shorter feeding periods. And we also went on to show that we see a similar time course in the change in microbial populations within the rumen. So I wanted to show this example of a diet by cow by product, product interaction with HMTBA. So this experiment, we had 16 high and 14 low producing cows, fed HMTBA or control, and we have three dietary risk phases. So we had a low risk phase, uh, higher NDF, no oil, go to moderate, we drop NDF, increase oil, and then high risk, drop NDF more and increase oil more. These are our low producing cows and our high producing cows. You can see our low producing cows, when we go to the medium and high risk, they start dropping milk fat, but not all that much. Our high producing cows, when we go to the medium and high risk, our control cows are dropping rapidly while our HMTBA cows are maintaining higher milk fat. And this was a 0.7 percentage unit difference in milk fat at the end of the experiment. And when we look at our trans-10 isomer, we see the same thing, that the low producing cows never have a big increase in the trans-10 isomer. These high producing cows have the shift to the trans-10 isomer. So I always like to say, if I did this experiment with low producing cows, I would tell you that Alimet does nothing. And if I did this experiment on a safe diet, I would tell you Alimet does nothing. But it's only when we tease out these interactions that we can see that Alimet can prevent the shift to the trans-10 pathway when you have this challenge and you uh, uh, have this increased risk for milk fat depression. So we went on to uh, uh, replicate this in a third and a fourth experiment, just showing that the third experiment, um, well, a second, third, and fourth experiment. So this is the, the second experiment in, in that using a similar approach where we can see when we go into a moderate and a high risk challenge period that we uh, prevent that shift to the trans-10 pathway and uh, maintain higher milk fat percent. What's the mechanism? Well, our uh, re recent deep, deep sequencing data show that HMTBA maintains rumen microbial diversity. We're not sure exactly which of those microbes is important, uh, but it is a rumen effect. We cannot rule out that there also could be a post-absorptive mechanism 
methionine does have an impact on liver fatty acid metabolism. Okay, so the next part of this is we want to know, can trace minerals impact risk for milk fat depression? Copper and magnesium sulfate are uh, soluble in the rumen versus uh, um, uh, our hydroxy sources. Copper has been observed to decrease fiber digestion and alter microbial growth in vitro. And there's this paper out of Bill Weiss's group that showed that total tract NDF digestibility was increased almost three percentage units with hydroxy trace minerals compared to control. So we've observed that acetate supply increases milk fat yield over in normal conditions. And rumen conditions associated with increased fiber digestibility are associated with lower risk for milk fat depression. Uh, so we wanted to know if, if um, it would have an effect there. So just quickly, our, our acetate data, we see that when we give 600 grams of acetate, we get 200 grams of milk fat. So if you're increasing fiber digestibility, increasing acetate, you'd have the potential to increase milk fat. So the experiment, we have conventional versus Intellibon, three dietary phases, low risk for 21 days, seven days moderate risk, three days for our high risk. And this is long enough to see a change in those trans uh, intermediates. So we saw uh, no effect of Intellibon on milk yield or dry matter intake. We had uh, production levels that were in uh, uh, mid-90s in the experiment. We also saw no interaction, uh, no effect and no interaction of Intellibon on milk fat percent or trans-10 intermediate. So, uh, you know, I, I, I always hate to not prove my hypothesis, but it, it, it looks like uh, the mechanism of Intellibon in the rumen is not interacting with these risk factors for milk fat depression in the way that we've tested here. So our, our, our model is based on decreasing fiber and increasing unsaturated fatty acids. Now, there'd be other risk factors that it might interact with, but within the realm of this experimental model, we didn't see the interaction. Uh, very quickly, we did a, a high lake soybean experiment recently, and we were able to see that high lake soybean increased milk fat, and uh, we also increased milk fat when we were feeding more soybeans, which we didn't think was ha would happen. We thought we were actually going to see the opposite. Um, but I just wanted to, to, to show that data. I'm running out of time, so we'll, we'll not spend a lot of time on that. Okay, so our summary. We need to think about who and what we're trying to help. We need, else, need to also think about when things work best and not just if they work or not, and therefore we have to set up the experimental scenario to test that situation. Um, and really this is no different than what we done before, to me it's just being more honest about it, that before our observation was based on the scenario that was there, the basal diet, the cows we picked, all of that, right? Now it's saying, okay, we're going to pick this scenario because we think we can have an effect there. Now we're going to see if we can have that effect. And oh, by the way, if we can do it more efficiently with shorter periods, um, we can test some more of these interactions and hopefully tease out what's going on. We can officially design those experiments to tease us apart, but we have to be careful in the design and the interpretation. Many interactions that have not been explored. Some of our limitations, nutrition experiments are done in non-competitive eating environments, in tie stalls mostly. Uh, there's a difference in the number of meals and size of meals. Uh, we're also very interested in this feeding pattern over the day that can interact. Best model for testing many important immune functions is not really clear. Again, I'm staying away from the disease side in my talk, uh, but, but a lot of important um, um, methodology we need to work out there. Traditional methods for running experiments and collecting samples have inherent limitations, uh, but precision technology, robotics, automated sensors may help. You know, down the road, maybe we can uh, uh, set more of this up on farms to, to tease that apart. Thank you for your time, and I uh, want to recognize the people that do the hard work back in the lab. Um, and we've had uh, the benefit of funding both from the USDA and, and industry sponsors. Thank you, Dr. Harventine. Uh, we do have a few questions here that came in on the app. Um, I think the first question here is, uh, is recovery time from milk fat depression 
once dietary cause or causes are corrected, dependent primarily on rumen adjustment time or post-absorptive factors? Yeah, so uh, it's definitely rumen adaptation. So uh, we've looked at the time course of recovery back when I was in Dale Bauman's lab. We milk cows every four hours during CLA treatment and then after CLA treatment, and we can get recovery within, say, three to five days um, from the mammary gland side. Uh, it takes longer for the rumen to adapt, but, but you do have both occurring. The rumen has to adapt, and then you have to, to turn over those fatty acids in the body. Okay. Uh, a second question here. Are you able to see how the rumen microbial populations are changing during uh, per uh, throughout the model, and would that help us better explain diet and genetic interactions? Uh, so I wonder if this is, so, so during our, our perturbation model where we're, we're bolus dosing in, we have not done any microbial profiling uh, during that. Um, we've done some, some microbial profiling, and I, I, I'm not a microbiologist, uh, I, I, I don't claim to, to have great knowledge here, but we, we have some good collaborations with folks that do microbiome work and, and have given them our, our samples. What we see is the most common thing, and this is across four data sets, is that uh, when you go into milk fat depression, you have a decrease in microbial diversity, and when we come out in, during recovery, uh, you increase that microbial diversity again. Now, when you have hundreds to thousands of microbial species changing, it's hard to say exactly who's the key player there. Um, but but we've, we've done those experiments both during induction and recovery. Thank you. Uh, one, um, one more here. You showed an inverse relationship between milk fat and milk yield. Within herd, does this relationship still hold if you adjust for dry matter, or excuse me, days in milk and parity? Yeah, uh, so this is a little bit dependent on your data set, right? So, um, like, I have a data set with 60,000 cow records from a DHI database. And in that database, days in milk actually fits a little bit better than milk yield. But I wonder if that just tells us how poorly milk yield observations are in BHIA testing, right? Because uh, you only have a single, a single measurement on at, a, at a single milking quite often. So, so I, um, those two are, are a little bit too confounded to be able to exactly separate them. And I, and I worry that the errors are different there, that, that it, uh, I, I don't think I can make the biological interpretation. Um, what we're working on right now is we have 1,700 cows uh, where we have just a single test day sample, but we've ran fatty acid analysis on that sample. So we have trans 10, and we're trying to uh, basically model how much of the variation can we explain based on trans 10 versus um, milk yield and genetic potential and some of those other factors. And what we're seeing is that, that not any one of those factors is explaining the lion's share of the variation, but that each is having its own, its own effect. Um, but just in, I, I hate saying this because it's just in, in sort of uh, crude analysis, but in a number of data sets, the general relationship we see is that for every 10 pound increase in milk yield, it's a 0.1 unit decrease in milk fat percent. Um, and that, that's just as a general rela relationship. It does not have to be. It's not a cause effect, but, but that's the general relationship okay. that we see. Thank you. I, I think we have time for one more here. Um, in the Intellibon study, do you infer that, room, the, that the rumen was just so overwhelmed under these conditions to show an NDFD response versus sulfates? Yeah, and uh, so I, I think that's a very important point to make about models. And, um, you know, I, so, so I, I, I guess I don't want to be mis, I don't want to misconstrue that, 
I, I believe in using experimental models. I think there's a lot of value there, but we have to be careful about them, and there's, the models can be misused. So there's times where you're, you're hitting something with the sledgehammer, and if, if you're hitting it so hard uh, that something cannot, that can overwhelm an effect, right? Uh, so that's where we've tried to be more modest in our dietary challenges that we've done, uh, and we've tried to sort of titrate between those. Um, but it could be that, that you know, our, our um, approach is pretty heavy on unsaturated fat treatment. It could be that we've overwhelmed a, a mechanism because of that level of un, unsaturated fat. Um, I think another good example of this would be LPS challenge work in immune function. I mean, there, there's, I don't know if there's a bigger hammer than LPS challenge. Um, so so you, can, you can overwhelm your, your effects. So again, you, we have to be careful to interpret within the scenario that we created. Thank you, and let's give Dr. Harventine a round of applause.